Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Global Ethics Month discussion on the landmark Supreme Court case of Loving v. Virginia. My name is Rebecca Weisberger, and I am a junior psychology and political science major here at UNC, and this is my first semester as an intern with the UNC Office of Ethics and Policy. Before we get started with the panel, I wanted to cover a few logistics for tonight. We will be recording tonight's panel, and it will be posted on the Office of Ethics and Policy's YouTube and social media channels afterward. At the end of the panel, we will have a short question and answer session. If you have a question at any point during the discussion, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and it will be passed on to the panelists during that time. All questions will be answered during the second portion of the program. Without further ado, let me introduce tonight's panelists. William H. Chafe's long professional scholarship reflects his long-term interest on the issues of race and gender equality. Former Dean of Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Duke University, he is the Alice Mary Baldwin Professor Emeritus of History there, as well as the co-founder of the Duke UNC Center for Research on Women, the Duke Center for Study of Civil Rights and Race Relations, and the Duke Center for Documentary Studies. He has been awarded the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award, the Sidney Hillman Book Award, and the Lillian Smith Award. Danielle McGuire is an award-winning historian, public speaker, and the author of At the Dark End of the Street, which won the Frederick Jackson Turner Award and the Lillian Smith Book Award. She is the recipient of the Lerner Scott Prize for Best Dissertation in Women's History and the A. Elizabeth Taylor Prize for Best Essay in Southern Women's History. McGuire is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and is an adjunct associate professor of history at Wayne State University. She is currently working on a book about police violence in Detroit in 1967. Great, now we, we will be moving on to the main portion of our panel. The focus of our discussion tonight is going to be examining the court case and how it fits in today's social climate. We'll be focusing on how this decision came to be, the ramifications of the decision, and anything the documentary may have missed. Now let's begin with our first question. So to what extent does the documentary give an accurate depiction of the time period? Uh, Dr. Chafe, if you could start us out with this one. Well, I think it's an accurate description of the time period in the sense of this kind of a case coming before the Supreme Court. The 1960s was without question the most dr dramatic and vibrant period of social activism that we've seen in this country probably ever. Uh, you start with the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 54. Uh, then you had the Montgomery bus boycott uh, in 55, 56. Uh, you have the formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And then starting in 1960, you have the Greensboro sit-ins, which basically exploded the entire uh, social activism of young people. Uh, so that after the Greensboro sit-ins, you have essentially uh, 72 sit-in demonstrations taking place in 54 different cities uh, over the uh, over eight states in the next in the next year and a half, and that leads ultimately to the creation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was the most cutting edge and radical um, grassroots civil rights organization. Uh, so, in the the overall group, you've got the NAACP, which has been there since 1909. Uh, you've got the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, then you've got SNCC. Uh, and then you have a variety of other urban league and other, other groups coming together. Uh, but this is a period of incredible, intense demonstrations. Uh, and in some ways, uh, the, the Loving case is consistent with the movement and its objectives, but it's really not part of the movement, only in the sense that it's a, a legal manifestation of what's been going on in the movement. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, Dr. McGuire, if you want to speak on that as well. Yeah, I would I would say, you know, it's interesting because Mildred Loving says, you know, she's not part of the movement. She knows who Dr. King is and she, you know, wants to meet him, but she's one of the majority of people who are really not involved in the civil rights movement. I know it's trendy now for everyone to say they marched with King, but the majority of people didn't do that then. And she was one of them. Um, but, you know, her case fits into not just um, you know, the civil rights struggle of the times and, and all of the legal precedents that led up to that, particularly the Brown decision, but also of course the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, but it also fits into a really a long struggle by black women 
to gain autonomy and bodily integrity, right? Because the ban on interracial marriage is rooted in a law that um, began under slavery, right? It, it, it's a law that starts in 1691 in Virginia where they ban miscegenation and they make criminal uh, the intermarriage um, between, uh, what do they say, mulattoes, Indians, Negroes, uh, with white people. So this is, a, this is a legacy of slavery. It's one of, I think, one of the last pillars of slavery to really um, be standing. It's, it's crazy that it didn't fall until 1967. Um, but, it's, but, it's, but I think when you, when you sort of zoom out and you look at a much broader picture, we can, which we can talk about more, uh, of Black women's struggles for um, the right to their own bodies and the right to make decisions about their bodies, then this is really central to that struggle, which has been uh, rooted in campaigns since, um, since enslavement. You uh, kind of touched on this, but what was the precedent for marriage prior to the Loving ruling? Like very explicitly, just for people that may not be aware. You know, I'm, I'm not a legal scholar, and, and so I don't know all of the like legal precedents before this. But my understanding is that it was um, it was something that the states uh, were um, basically in charge of legislating. Um, and the argument in this case really came down to, well, is it really a state issue or is it a federal issue? Is this, is, is marriage a constitutional right? Mm -hmm. Um, and the lawyers, uh, for the Lovings, um, Bernard Cohen and his partner said, yes, right. It was, and they made that case and they successfully made that case. So I think prior to this, you had, um, states determining who could marry, um, and who could not marry. And of course, there were more than, it was more than Virginia, it was 16 or 18 states that banned interracial marriage at the time, um, almost all of which were former slave states. So there's that connection as well. Um, so. I think the other thing which is really interesting here is uh, uh, the degree to which state laws were predominant really uh, through much of this entire period. And really, uh, the civil rights movement helps to elevate the importance of the federal government and congressional legislation uh, as the vehicle for helping to train, change this to the entire society. The movement is taking place in local communities and cities across the South. Um, uh, but it's really uh, uh, when this gets to the March on Washington and the demand for uh, federal legislation, which is going to transform the legal structure, that's when you start getting much more focus on this on the federal government. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, that's, that's so important. And so much of the civil rights struggle in the 1950s and 60s is to really bring the federal government in to, to, to get the federal government to enforce the 14th and 15th amendments, right? And this case really rests on the 14th amendment. Um, and how you interpret it and how you apply it and how you enforce it. And so I think in some ways, you know, and I don't, I, I, I'm interested to hear your position on this, Dr. Chafe, like, do you think you needed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 before you get to a decision like Loving? Yeah, I think you probably do. I think you do because, and I, th I think we're actually uh, ironically in a very parallel situation today where there is a movement back uh, toward state government and state legislation. Um, and particularly if you see an overthrow of the Roe v. Wade decision by the Supreme Court, um, and if you see uh, a return uh, to state government in terms of what's going to be appropriate for both marriage, but also in terms of uh, uh, segregation and stuff like that, you're going to see a very significant retreat uh, from where we have been, so that we're re really seeing the beginning here in the 60s of a, a rather remarkable uh, ascendancy of the federal government and national authority uh, on these issues, which previously had been pretty much limited to local department, local local governments. Um, so, kind of focusing back on prior to the decision, actually, I want to talk about. Uh, 
what were the conditions like in other states? Was Virginia or the South unique in its anti-miscegenation statutes or its level of segregation? What was the consensus as a whole throughout the nation? I know that it might be different throughout the states, but if you could just give like a greater picture of what that was like. Danielle? You know, like I said, I'm not an expert on anti-miscegenation laws, but what I can say is that, um, and like what the film does make clear, and what we know is that um, interracial marriage was banned in at least 16, I think maybe 18 states uh, in 1967. Mm -hmm. And um, and that that's less than it was, you know, throughout history. I mean, there have been bans on interracial marriage in, in other states and over time. Um, not unique to the South, but I want to say with certainty that it was definitely rooted in um, in slavery. And it was rooted in slavery, I think, for um, a very simple reason. And that was so that white men uh, who, you know, were in power at the time could maintain their control over, I think, the social, political, economic, and, you know, everyday status quo. They could maintain their political, social, economic hierarchy, right? Their position atop of that hierarchy. And one of the ways they did it was through a ban on interracial marriage and a ban on miscegenation. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that that law, you know, helped create a system in which they were allowed to control both white and black women's bodies. They could control white and black women's marital choices and black men's marital choices that way. And it left them with all the power. The law didn't ban interracial sex or childbirth out of wedlock. So the law actually gave them power to, in some ways, assault Black women with impunity. Um, and because at the time, you know, a number of those Black women, particularly in a state like Virginia, were enslaved, uh, this gave them uh, power to um, attack their property with impunity, and it also added, you know, it was part of an, a system of laws which made children born to Black women, uh, you know, follow their follow their status, right? That their if the if the mother was um, enslaved, then the child would follow the mother's status and not the father's. So when you take these kinds of laws together, you create a system where white men are basically in charge of women's bodies, in charge of um, what happens to them and there's there's no punishment for what they do. It also creates a system where um, if a white man fathers a child with an enslaved woman, that child becomes a slave like the mother, um, but also, you know, that child is not, uh, does not have access to any kind of inheritance rights from the father. So it maintains a kind of inheritance um, hierarchy as well and a property line. Um, and so, when slavery ends, those laws continue. And in some ways, those are the laws that make up um, the foundations of slavery and create the kind of, you know, the white supremacist world that enslavement um, both embodies and reinforces. I think I want to say one, one other thing that, that we generally tend to forget. Um, most people think that most of us learn in school that after nine years or 10 years of reconstruction after the Civil War, then basically you have complete segregation and disenfranchisement and everything else. And that really ignores the degree to which was a very vibrant black and white biracial movement uh, throughout the entire South, uh, not just in the reconstruction period, but in the 1880s in Virginia, and then throughout the many of the southern states in the 1890s with biracial populism, where you have white and black governments populated by both races, leading very progressive uh, administrations in terms of public education, in terms of social welfare. Uh, and, and basically, these are people who are fighting for biracial democracy. And it's only in the 1890s uh, that that gets completely suppressed. Uh, it's starting in Mississippi. Uh, and then culminating in North Carolina, uh, when you have a very successful, vibrant North, uh, biracial government in North Carolina from 1894 to 1898. And then it comes the Wilmington race riot, started largely by rich white men who claim that 
white, the claim that black men are out to rape white women. And the Wilmington race riot leads to the suppression of that regime. And then three years later, the disenfranchisement of black people. And so by 1901, you have a very different situation, which is complete segregation, complete oppression, racial oppression uh, that really lasts until the end of the New Deal and the beginning of World War II and the kind of change that ultimately leads to the civil rights movement. And I'll just add that what's interesting to me is that Virginia felt like it had to make a new law, the 1924 anti-miscegenation or racial integrity law, uh, because they already had the 1691 law on its books um, that banned mis, you know, miscegenation and uh, interracial marriage essentially, but then they created this new law, the 1924 Racial Integrity Act. And what's interesting about that is the way that sort of wrapped into kind of a, a progressive movement um, that is uh, part of a larger campaign to um, both, uh, you know, uh, create race and, and, you know, the structure of race, uh, who, who is white, who is black, right? Um, but it also is part of a, a movement to um, root out people who are weak, who are others, who are feeble-minded, right? It's part of a eugenics movement as well. And so um, it's, it's rooted in these histories where uh, it, it's about the strong versus the weak, right? The people with power versus the people who are uh, disempowered. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's still, I think, such a powerful case um, that we look to today. Um, this is definitely pivoting from where we are right now, and but was something that we have been kind of getting at this whole time. So. Why do you think the loving ruling happened exactly when it did? Well, I think it's part of a very, very interesting trend in the Supreme Court um, and in legal strategy by NAACP lawyers. Uh, basically, the court becomes a much more activist and involved part of the government. Uh, really all, all during the period from the 1900 all the way up through the New Deal. In fact, as you remember, uh, Franklin Roosevelt tried to pack the new, pack the Supreme Court because the court was so reactionary and it suppressed most of the New Deal legislation. Um, so you only begin to see how the court becomes a liberating institution with the success of the NAACP in a series of cases starting in the late 1940s, culminating in, in Brown v. Board of Education. But then the court becomes really a very different kind of body, which has never been like again. But with Earl Warren as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, and with a much more activist group of people who are judges, uh, it really becomes an instrument for social change Whereas in the past, it's almost always been an instrument for social control, and it's now returning to that position of being an instrument of social control, not change or justice. Thank yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, what's interesting, too, is that this case builds on those precedents, right? Um, particularly the Brown case, but of course, the, the federal legislation in 64 and 65, um, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. Uh, because in this case, uh, you know, the ACLU is, it ha has to, they have this problem at the beginning, right? They have to go back to the lo local judge where uh, the case has jurisdiction. And um, the local judge's decision is rooted in a very racist belief, right? That God has created the races and there's five of them. And, um, and this is just how things are. Well, court precedent has already said that that's that's unconstitutional, that you can't do that, that that's a racist belief uh, that you're using to make judgments. And so on some level, you know, they were very lucky that the judge said that and they could use that then to reopen the case. Um, but I don't think you get the results without the Warren court and without the precedents that are being set and without really the pressure probably by Earl Warren to create, um, you know, consensus on the court in these cases. Like this is a this is a nine to zero decision just like the Brown decision. And that's really important for cases like this that overturn um, racist and, and white supremacist 
uh, laws, right? You need that kind of um, consensus to make it, mm -hmm. I think, palatable to a public that's been uh, conditioned to believe in these things. I think here it's important to highlight the importance of an individual. Uh, Earl Warren being that individual, he was the progressive governor of uh, California who made the terrible mistake of incarcerating Japanese Americans during World War II and always regretted that. And then he, when he was named Chief Justice, he took it upon himself to basically listen to and then try to win over all the judges in the court. So if you look at the Brown decision, what's really important is that was a 63 decision at the beginning. And Earl Warren personally worked closely with the three dissenting judges and persuaded all of them to sign on to the decision. Uh, Warren becomes, in effect, the political leader of a judicial institution, and he carries that forward until his departure from the court. And it's really what makes his period on the court really a deviation from the whole history of the court up till then. Uh, and he's really a remarkable person who deserves a great deal of credit for, in a sense, finally trying to compensate for his mistake in World War II. Thank you. Um, something that we haven't really talked about, what, but I think kind of is demonstrated throughout the documentary is how do you think that the media attention that the case received impacted the situation as a whole? I know the documentary kind of shows how Mildred wanted to communicate because she thought that their story could maybe help others, whereas Richard was a bit more reserved. And I was wondering if you thought that that had any impact on ultimately the verdict. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it, it, it doesn't have the kind of immediate attention that a lot of the other cases do or that the civil rights movement had at its height, right? Um, by 1967, the United States is involved heavily in the war in Vietnam. Um, there's been a, well, I, I, I can't remember what the date is where they decide this. Is it before or after the summer of 67? It's before, I think. It's before it. So there hasn't been Detroit and Newark yet. Um, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I do think that obviously there's been a lead up of precedence, um, and public support for civil rights. And, and this is, this is not marketed, that's the wrong word, but it's, but it's part of that, um, narrative. And, you know, her husband is obviously very soft-spoken, doesn't want to be part of the um, the media spotlight and, uh, and, sh and, sh and she kind of goes along with him in that sense, but, you know, their community is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, um, they didn't focus on that maybe enough. Um, I, do you want to say something, Dr. Chafe? No, yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm Bill and you're Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> We've known uh, each other for a long time. But. I think basically you're right in that um, I, this is a situation where uh, the court knows it's breaking this new ground, um, but it does so in a way that uh, minimizes immediate disruption. Uh, does cause states to have to change their laws. Um, but it's consistent with where the court is going during this period of time. So I do think that uh, we're seeing basically the consequence of uh, essentially, well, Warren becomes Chief Justice and uh, the end of 53. And we're basically seeing now uh, some of the consequences of uh, what, mean, what it means to have him as leader of the court. Uh, and the court is a very different institution. Uh, and it's always fascinating to think about the politics of the Supreme Court. Uh, you're seeing that today, uh, not only with the nomination of Barrett, but you're also seeing uh, the way in which Chief Justice Roberts 
is essentially threading the needle. He's a conservative, but he's trying to win over support among the liberals. And he has been the deciding vote in upholding the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, he is really moving toward the liberal side as a way of holding the court together. And it's about to fall apart. I'll also add, you know, just in that regard that the case, um, you know, requires, this decision requires that the states that still have um, interracial marriage bans have, have mm -hmm. to adjust that. But just like with Brown, it's not like, you know, state leaders uh, said, oh, the Supreme Court made a law, we're going to change, right? A lot of states resisted that. And, and it's, it's shocking, you know, every time I see it, it's shocking that Alabama resisted this um, this, uh, this law until 2000. And when they finally made interracial marriage legal, I mean, that's insane, right? But it just goes to show the whole that this idea, um, both of racial purity and, um, the threat that interracial marriage has to that idea had and continues to have on a lot of people. Yeah. And I also think it's important for the students to understand the complexity of this situation. The Supreme Court decides nine to nothing that school segregation is unconstitutional. It is really not until 17 years later that we really had desegregation of schools. And that is largely because states are able to, to resist and the Supreme Court is really reluctant to, to come down hard on them until it finally has to do so and then um, in 1971, that's what happens. But it's, that's, that's, that's basically 17 years later. So since some states did not immediately change their laws as a reactionary measure, what do you think would be the largest impact of the Loving ruling? Well, I think there's a lot of impacts. Um, I, you know, my work is on uh, sexualized violence, sexualized and racial violence, right? And so I actually see the loving decision as um, a legal nail in the coffin of slavery, uh, one of the last, right? One of the last pillars of slavery to fall. I see it as um, a law that uh, was rooted in um, a system that was designed to oppress and subjugate black women and to use and abuse their bodies with impunity. And I, I, see, the, I see the case as um, a, a legal hallmark for black women's bodily integrity um, so that black women's bodies, you know, white men and other men couldn't exploit black women uh, without impunity anymore. Um, although that of course is not really true because we still have, you know, endless stories about that. Um, but it's an important legal precedent. And I do think that it helped to um, bring about a number of legal victories for black women in, in cases related to sexual violence, particularly interracial sexual violence. Um, that's kind of a different topic, but I think that it's really important in that, in that sense when we look at it with the long view, you know, going all the way back to 1691. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I think also the importance of that decision as the predecessor of what then follows after it, and the Obergefell, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the decision uh, which essentially sanctifies the marriage choice of whoever you are, whether you're gay, whether you're straight, whatever race you come from, uh, that the Obergefell decision could never happen without the loving decision. Yeah, and I and I think it's really interesting. I, I was doing some reading today just on you know the relationship between Loving and Oberfell and and you know what was symbolic about it, what's so important about it. And I think the Loving decision is really you know it puts teeth in the Fourteenth Amendment. It puts teeth in the, into the Due Process Clause. Um, it puts teeth into the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, it makes it makes marriage choice and individual liberty so crucial to the pursuit of happiness, for example, um, that's, that's just grounded in the constitution so tightly that um, it's remarkable really. Um, it, it actually gave me a lot of hope today reading about this. Like I thought, ooh, maybe it's so cemented into the constitution, you know, we're not gonna lose these rights. 
Um, but of course, as a historian, we know <laughs> things are always being knocked down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I but I think you know it, it does it, it it puts real strong teeth into the Fourteenth yeah. Amendment. Yeah. So kind of going off of that, what do you make of Justice Alito and Thomas's recent comments about their willingness to potentially turn overturn Obergefell? And in that case, Loving was actually cited nearly a dozen times. Well, I think we are in a situation where the politics of the Supreme Court becomes as fascinating and scary a topic as it was back in the 1930s when the Supreme Court invalidated every piece of New Deal legislation that was enacted. Uh, and it took a long, it took basically uh, at least 15 years before that court could be changed. And if you think about where we are now and what's about to happen with Barrett as uh, a new chief, a new justice. Um, even if Roberts were to continue his current trend toward voting with uh, a moderate majority, they will lose, and it will all fall apart, and we will be in a in a constitutional crisis, and our politics will basically reflect that. We will be coming apart. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing about being a historian is that we have, we, we have all this precedent for that happening. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not a comfortable position to be in where we know, you know, what we've made can be undone. Um, as much as I gained hope from reading those articles today, I also am terrified by um, their ability, you know, and, and their, their constant sort of reference as originalists um, to the Constitution, um, and not this kind of like like second Constitution, which was the Reconstruction Amendments, um, which are so important uh, to the rights that we have today, and that and that we call on again and again in these kinds of cases. So um, I'm scared that they're going to um, pull the teeth out of the Fourteenth Amendment, yeah, and and negate it in a way that the court had for decades from Plessy v. Ferguson to Brown, right? I think the fact is that both Danielle and I are scared. Yeah, <laughs> I understand that. Um, what do you think some of the less publicized ramifications of the loving ruling are? I think that there's certainly an impact on the whole gay rights movement. I think that there is a recognition that individual choices are those for individuals to make and not for the society to make. And I think that that entire ethical and philosophical approach is really central to what we've become as a country as long as we can stay on that path. Right. In some ways, it answers the question, you know, what does freedom mean? Right. It's, it's, it's one answer to that question. What does freedom mean? And in this case, it, it's the freedom to choose who you want to wake up next to in the morning and who you want to, um, you know, inherit your property and who you want to be your, your, um, your attorney, your proxy if you're sick and in the hospital and can't make decisions. I mean, these are really crucial important individual um, rights issues that are central to being free from state control. And so um, I think there's that. I also think that, of course, you know, the whatever project there was to maintain, you know, white purity is, um, you know, has never really been real, but um, has never worked uh, for that, in that sense. But it, you know, interracial marriage has um, increased dramatically since it's become legal. And we see um, those choices um, being celebrated and honored and um, treated, you know, with the respect that they've always deserved to be treated with. Thank you. Um, we've also gotten into this a bit, but I wanted to ask more explicitly, how does the legacy of Loving v. Virginia factor into today's political, legal, and social climate? Just holistically, and then I have a few examples. 
Well, we have a president who is using race as his primary organizing principle. And that means that uh, he is casting aspersions on anyone who wants to change uh, the way in which we talk about race or the way in which we interact with people of a different race. And I think that uh, we are essentially facing an election which is uh, testing, as it's never been tested before, the degree to which we choose to be a multiracial democracy. Yeah, I'm not sure I could put it any better than that. Yeah, I think you basically covered all the examples that I was going to throw out, except for one. So I wanted to talk about how um, still this kind of like mainstream sexual exploitation of Black women factors into our modern society and how Loving v. Virginia kind of counters that, but also doesn't as we're still seeing these issues. Well, the documentary, I think, is a, a very interesting. I mean, mm. I mean, uh, Ms. Loving is uh, an amazingly mature, respectable, proper person. There's no way, and 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 her husband, who is basically someone who is much more a blue collar, grassroots uh, white person, uh, is with her. Uh, and supporting her, even though he's not doing so in the same way that she does. So that it's kind of an amazing example of the of reality as opposed to myth. Yeah, his 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 relationship with her, you know, one rooted in respect and love and not exploitation, in, in some ways is a stark contrast to the way white men had treated black women for centuries, right? And, and that's particularly why I think he's such a threat um, to the local sheriff, um, why, he, why, you know, his willingness, his, um, his, you know, respect for his um, commitment to the black community in that sense um, is, is such a threat to uh, white supremacy and to, um, in some ways a segregated order of Virginia at that time, you know, because here, here's a white man who um, fits the bill for all of the scare tactics, you know, segregationists have used forever, who has willingly gone into the black community and has found friendship and love and relationships and family and um, happiness, right? And security and his own personal dignity. And um, it, 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 it makes the whole story of white supremacy a lie um, and a black inferiority a lie, right? Um, and I think, you know, going back to your question, you know, that history is still very much alive. I mean, black women are still some of the most um, vulnerable and least protected uh, people in our society. Uh, we see that with, um, you know, the, the tens of thousands of um, uh, cases, uh, rape cases, for example, if, you know, some of you might know about the um, untested rape kits that have been abandoned in cities all across America that ha organizations have been working to test. And a lot of those are from women of color and they were abandoned and untested and, and left on a shelf um, because they were women of color, because they were working class or poor women of color who, who were um, not important to the system, right? Not, those cases weren't important to them to solve. Um, or you think about the case of Daniel Holtzclaw, the police officer in Oklahoma City, who, um, who knew that black women um, were the least protected, the least likely to be believed by police, um, who were um, the most easy to exploit in the system, a system that's rooted in this history, uh, who targeted black women for sexual assault. And he did it while he was on the job and he got caught, right? Um, and, and, and a jury convicted him, which was surprising really um, in the historical trajectory. Um, and so I think black women are still fighting for bodily integrity. I think they're still fighting to be seen. Um, I think they're still fighting for um, the same rights that uh, white women are often you know, have. Um, and I, th I think this is all part of that same legacy.
And I think Mildred Loving is one of legions of black women who have led in the struggle for these rights, um, the right to move through the world without being assaulted, the right to choose who you want to be in a relationship with, the right to consensual sex, right? Um, she's part of that long legacy of black women um, being at the center of those struggles for all of us really. Thank you, that was a great response. Um, so the last question for our prepared questions would be, what do you think the major theme, idea, or lesson people should take away from the Loving Story documentary and the Loving case as a whole? I understand it's kind of broad, but- I don't know. I mean, one I think is like, uh, you know, we need the 14th Amendment. We need it to be strong, robust. Uh, it, 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 is, um, it is a powerful tool um, at the disposal for individual rights and liberty uh, and equality and equal protection under the law. And uh, woe, woe to America if it's defanged. Um, I also think it's uh, an incredible story of commitment to a relationship, a partnership, um, a a sort of a love at all costs kind of story. But, it, but it's more than that because it's about what it means to be free and what it means to have liberty and, and the right to pursue happiness. You know, in that sense, it's a quintessential American story um, that, that I think is timeless. Yeah. I could not agree with Danielle Moore. And I think that what we really see here is the embodiment of the idea of individual rights as the foundation of our constitutional democracy. That as individuals, we make choices and we are free to make those choices. And society is there to support those choices, not to undermine or destroy them. And I think that that's what we have to keep in mind on all these issues, race, uh, sexuality, uh, who we are, and unless we recognize and celebrate that individuality, uh, we have basically betrayed the ideas embodied in our Constitution. That was great. Thank you so much. So that marks the end of our prepared questions, and we will now be moving on to some of the questions from our audience. So please type your questions using the Q&A button on your Zoom dashboard, and we will ask them on your behalf. So I already have one question, so I'm just going to get the ball rolling. A question from the audience, not from myself. So the first question is, have current Supreme Court appointments made nine decisions a bygone era? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that's really important is to change, to, to look back over time and the number of choices who were approved by Congress by more than 80 votes has been traditional until the last 10 years. Mm. Uh, when we now are in a situation where it's sometimes a question of one, two, three, four, five votes, but it's not anything like 85 votes. And I believe that that speaks a lot to the degree to which we are becoming a more polarized nation. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine a 9-0 ruling with this court right now. Um, I, I can see how Roberts could be the kind of justice that could work to bring people together if that's the choice, you know, if that's, it, if that's what he wants to do. Um, I think in any major case, like, for example, if the Supreme Court has to decide the election, <laughs> huh. uh, which I, I dread, um, it, it, you know, to me, that would be a great opportunity for Roberts to create a consensus um for every vote to count right not to stop the counting 
not to limit voting, not to, you know, agree with any kind of voter suppression tactic that's ongoing right now, but to let every vote be counted. Um, that would that would give integrity to the court. It would give him integrity as chief justice. Um, I, I, I don't know if he's that person. I don't know if the other justices will go along with it. Yeah, that was a great point. Thank you so much. So kind of pivoting, were there any anti-miscegenation cases brought before Loving? And how did these cases fall short or how did they contribute to the eventual success of Loving? Hmm. I just don't know the answer to that question. No, do I. I'm certain there were cases like that. I mean, you know, there, there were black and white people married and living together in spite of um, and in opposition to uh, inter bans on interracial marriage. Yeah. Um, in some communities, they did it, everyone knew it, and it was fine, and no one made a big deal out of it. Um, in other places, it was much more difficult. But um, certainly, there were challenges in practice, maybe not in the law. Um, but I would be willing to just sort of throw it out there that there probably were a number of challenges, um, and that you just needed these kinds of legal precedents um, that were established by Brown and by the uh, um, federal you know, legislation in 64 and 65 to make, to kind of push it over the edge. Right. And I think we have to realize that bringing a case to the Supreme Court is an incredibly complicated, difficult process where you have to have many different levels of people signing on and willing to go to bat for um, this to happen. And I think it's very hard for a case to get to the Supreme Court. Uh, and this happens to be a case in which there was enough background and support that it could happen, but it doesn't happen very often. And let's not forget too, that people who were engaged in consensual interracial relationships, um, you know, under a segregated status quo, you know, prior to the sixties, you know, were often met with violence um, and fled, right? Uh, fled the state, uh, they didn't take it to court um, or they were killed. You know, there's a number of cases where you see, for example, you know, a white woman and a black man, for example, having a consensual relationship. And when they're caught, the white woman to protect herself um, from the mob will, um, or just to protect herself uh, in her own self-interest, will, you know, accuse her partner of rape. Um, there's a number of cases like that. So, you know, it's not like this is the first interracial relationship. I mean, that's mm -hmm. obvious. Um, but I just don't know the legal history. Um, no worries. Do you think that the Lovings had particular qualities that made them ideal for the process, similarly, similarly to Obergefell and his partner? Or you think that this was just a matter of happenstance, that they were the case that made it up there? Well, they're both so respectable and middle class that it's hard to decide that one of them is not ideal as a candidate for this kind of decision. Uh, and the fact that uh, both of them are, are as committed as they are uh, and as quiet and respectable as they are makes it an ideal situation. Yeah, I think there's definitely a politics of respectability around their case. Um, she's very light skinned. Uh, not that they were looking for a plaintiff that looked like her, but you know, historically, if you think about like Rosa Parks and other cases that go forward, you know, she fits that bill. Um, they're married, they have children, they're Christians, right? They are part of a, a, a very loving community, you know, pun intended. Um, but what's interesting too, too about them and their community is they come out of a, a, a community in Virginia that is interracial, right? That is, that is mixed white, African-American and Native American. And it's, and it's, um, it's not so stark, right? Um, and, you know, in that sense, like, I think it made the case, I don't know, in some ways, like, less threatening in their local community, because they're part of a community that is, that is intermixing, you know, and that's visible. Um, but also I think, you know, they certainly fit the bill on good looks, right? I mean, that they make for a very pretty picture in the New York Times. 
<laughs> yeah, that was doesn't hurt. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, another follow up to that would be: Do you think the fact that the husband was white and the wife was black in this case made a difference as opposed to the other way around potentially? I think that that probably helped the situation. Um, but I would like to think that uh, in the end it was immaterial, but I think it psychologically made a difference. Okay, last question, not a follow-up. It's a bit longer, so just bear with me for a second. Wait, before you start, can I just go back to that? I think oh, yeah, I actually think it's really important because I think if it were a white woman and a black man, um, you know, all of history's tropes about black men desiring white women, about attacking white women, about being threats to white families because they want white women would come into play. It would make the case, I think, harder to argue and harder to get kind of public support for. So I, I do actually think that it made a really big difference that it was a white man and a black woman, um, it, partly because, you know, white men were, were, you know, used to being in relationships with black women. Uh, and, and I, and I, and I, I, you know, in some ways consensual and in lots of ways not. Um, and so that wasn't such a stretch of the imagination compared to, you know, the myths and the ridiculous lies about black women or black men's desire for white women. Got it. Yeah, thank you. I understand that. So the last question. So people who have power versus people who are disempowered, heightened racial tensions, the threat of court packing. There are so many similarities between the era we've been talking about and our present time. Conversely, there are major differences, particularly in the realm of media, um, the social media, 24 hour news cycle, etc. With your historical perspective, what advice do you have for people who would want to enact change in our current times? Vote in 10 days. <laughs> or now, while you can. Vote now. Yeah, as soon I as think, possible. Yeah, th this election is going to decide a huge number of issues. And this is, this is by implication, one of them. I think that uh, we have to have a sense of unified commitment to a set of ground rules that are fair, that are going to make it a more equal society for everybody. And if we don't do that, we are in deep, deep doo-doo. And I, you know, I do think that these, these stories from the past, from our history, um, especially the civil rights movement, give us the tools we need to make change in our communities today. You know, if we understand the civil rights movement, um, then then we know that we have the power to make those changes, and that and that we should be getting active in our own communities in order to create the society that we want to live in. Uh, that we can't leave it up to someone else, right? Um, that we can't wait for the courts to decide. That we have to work on those issues in our communities. And I know North Carolina, for example, has had a really robust. Um, community action movement um, around the issues of healthcare and poverty and voting rights. And, and that's the kind of thing that really needs to be all over the country. Um, the movement gives us those tools. It gives us those strategies, those tactics. Um, and, and it's up to us to employ them now. Thank you so much. Um, so it seems like that was the end of our questions. So I will let you have some of your evening back. But before we go, I wanted to once again thank our panelists who took the time out of their day to join us. Thank you so much for engaging in this important discussion tonight. I also thank wanted you. to say <laughs> thank you again. I also wanted to say thanks again to everyone who turned in. Um, we learned a little bit tonight about Justice Warren's activism on the Supreme Court after his making up for his decisions regarding Japanese internment. So I encourage you to enjoy to join us next Monday evening at 5 p.m. for a presentation by Dr. Yusun Park on the complicity of social workers in Japanese internment. You can register for that event on the UNC Ethics and Policy website. 
Thank you all again, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.